Ladies and gentlemen, that's an honor for me to address you from Brussels. Uh, unfortunately, I, will not, I was not able to come to Stockholm and to take part in the Nordic Privacy Arena, which I was very keen on, but it's uh, due to unfortunate uh, circumstances uh, that happened last few weeks. You are probably aware of the fact uh, that the European Data Protection Supervisor Giovanni Buttarelli has lost his fight with the uh, illness and uh, he passed away three weeks ago and uh, it made us changing our calendars and our schedules of the meetings in the uh, next weeks after that. Uh, I was supposed to be in Stockholm while Giovanni was supposed to take part in the Joint Supervisory Committee on Europol which is the parliamentary institution of the European Parliament and the national parliaments having the control over the Europol. Since uh, EDPS is the supervisor of uh, Europol in the field of data protection, we are supposed to be there on, uh, and to present uh, our report on the recent inspections. And this is what I do exactly at the time when you are meeting in Stockholm. But uh, I'm happy to at least uh, contact with you this way and uh, to give my predictions uh, of uh, the uh, future of the data protection and the data protection issues. I've been asked to address the problem of next decade and what is at stake and what will happen as far as privacy protection is concerned. That's a very, very challenging subject, of course, planning uh, something and predicting, especially if you think about the future, not about the past, uh, is something that uh, uh, makes you actually a kind of magician and the person who wants to be the storyteller instead of being the regulator, as the EDPS should be. So I decided to go back to my notes from 2009, exactly 10 years ago, when I was preparing to the monitoring of the elections of the Data Protection Authority in Poland and uh, uh, I tried to predict what will be important uh, for next 10 years, uh, for next 5 and 10 years uh, uh, for the data protection in Europe and surprisingly we were not that far from the real problems that we met. Uh, we sometimes uh, uh, seen the uh, problems arising, we saw that there might be something new appearing. Of course, we cannot uh, uh, predict uh, if there is any kind of technical revolution that we are not aware of uh, and which will happen in the nearest future. But let's try to think about it, both from the legal point of view and from the technical point of view. Uh, European Data Protection Supervisor is the supervisor of EU institutions, bodies and agencies. Uh, so in this sense we are in no sense of the uh, National Data Protection Supervisors uh, and each of the EU, uh, EU National Data Protection Authority is an independent one who has a full jurisdiction over his territory. The same applies to the other countries which are the members of the Council of Europe uh, and that uh, are bound uh, by the uh, Convention 108 uh, of Council of Europe. So EDPS uh, is dealing with the institutions and bodies uh, as the supervisor. But at the same time, we are the main advisor and the main consultant in the all legislative processes that are going on in the European Union uh, throughout uh, the uh, normal activity of the legislators. It also means uh, that, we, uh, ha or that we take care of the uh, implementation of those things uh, which uh, come out of the regulations, GDPR, and uh, the special regulation which is for EU institutions, bodies and agencies, uh, but also about the horizontal approach to privacy and horizontal approach to data protection. So it means that we will go also go to the sectoral regulations which are prepared by the European Union and also to the cooperation of the European Union with the third countries, those that are outside of the typical European zone. For the Nordic countries, it's also important to remember that uh, the countries like Iceland and Norway are normally taking part in the all activities of the EU institutions, even if these countries are not the members of the European Union. But being the members of the European Economic Area, they have exactly the same rights uh, uh, and exactly the same way of dealing with the subjects uh, as it is in the EU countries. Uh, for the European Union law, privacy, and data protection are the fundamental rights. The right to uh, protection of the uh, personal data 
is a part of the Charter, is a part of the Article 16 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. And you are fully aware of the fact that last year we made a big reform of the data protection law in Europe. The reform which is still not finished because we still are lacking at least one big uh, puzzle of this uh, 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 of the system that we want to create, which is e-privacy regulation to exchange the e-privacy directive, which is right now in force. But GDPR is already in force, uh, and also the national jurisdictions and national parliaments went to the point where the national law somehow implementing uh, GDPR is also in place in all the European countries uh, uh, and uh, in all the countries uh, of the Nordic uh, region. We are also active in the European Data Protection Board, uh, which we are providing the Secretariat uh, for, where we try to uh, go into the harmonized approach to the data protection among those countries that are, the, uh, that are bound uh, by the GDPR uh, in Europe and in the European Economic uh, Area. But we also have to remember that when we talk about the legal approach and the practical uh, cooperation, we are not talking only about Europe. GDPR is a kind of benchmark for the legislation which is uh, uh, appearing in the other parts of the world. And right now we have more than 130 countries in the world which have the data protection law on the level of the statute and which can say that at least from the formal point of view they have a data protection law uh, harmonized inside the jurisdiction, inside the, inside the country. We try to talk with, this, uh, uh, with these countries, we try to uh, lead by example uh, in uh, dealing with the data protection law, but also we try to understand what might be the different approaches in different cultures to that. So one of my first predictions uh, for the next 10 years from the legal point of view is that we probably will not achieve the situation where we will have one treaty, which is a global approach to the data protection or privacy protection, but definitely both uh, the Convention 108 of the Council of Europe uh, will become more and more accessible, uh, 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 used, I may say, as a kind of vocabulary, common vocabulary for all these countries. Uh, and also GDPR will stay as a benchmark uh, for the data protection in uh, uh, the world. The very important novelties uh, appear in the jurisdictions which already were dealing with data protection before, but also those that are quite new. We have the new data protection law in many countries of Asia, especially in Southeastern Asia, but also we have a preparation to the data protection law in India, which might be a big uh, change as far, especially as outsourcing uh, services are concerned. There are a lot is going on in Africa. A lot is going on in uh, uh, Latin American countries which were so far outside of the uh, development uh, of the privacy law. There were the countries which already had a data protection law, like Argentina, for example, or Colombia. But we also have uh, new countries like Brazil, Peru, Chile, to deal with the privacy issues on the, uh, on the um, national level with the statutes. So we will not have the global treaty but we will have more and more coordination between the approaches of the different countries and different cultures dealing with the data protection. That of course drives us to the uh, discussion that we try to make in the, uh, in the scope of the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners, uh, which is right now the biggest uh, place uh, to discuss about the future. But from the legal point of view, the change which we see last years and which seems to be also true for the next years in Europe uh, is that the, the, active, the, the role of the courts uh, in the interpretation of the data protection law uh, st starts to be more and more visible. Uh, by 2014, it was hard to find any judgment from the Court of Justice of the European Union, which was dealing di uh, directly with the data protection law. It changed from 2014, but right now it's going uh, on and on. Right now we have about 15 cases which are in the Court of Justice uh, which are dealing uh, directly with the uh, issues connected with uh, either GDPR or the previous directive or the e-privacy directive and the other legislations like that. We also have, uh, we are also in the middle of the process uh, of the changes in the guidelines of the uh, OECD on privacy protection. 
But the challenges that we have uh, in the for the nearest future are mainly not the legal challenges. I don't expect that this next 10 years uh, will bring uh, revolution as far as the legal acts are concerned, but I'm, uh, I'm sure that they will bring a lot of uh, uh, changes uh, as far as the implementation in practice is concerned. When we prepared our uh, strategy of EDPS five years ago, one of our main ideas, main objectives, uh, was uh, to deal with the fact that data protection goes digital. It doesn't mean that the data goes digital because data went digital 40 years ago. It means that the protection of the personal data stops to be the legal subject. It's rather the subject connected with the organization of the processes and the architecture of the information systems. And this architecture of the information systems is probably the first challenge to all the data protection institutions, but also to all the uh, parties, that all the stakeholders that are dealing with the IT systems. In the European Union, we have dozens of the legal resources, legal bases uh, that are created on the uh, all European level that starts to be more and more interoperable with the same resources existing on the national level. This is mainly in the field of law enforcement, uh, but we can see it also in another fields which are uh, very loosely connected uh, with the uh, po police duties or uh, law enforcement duties and which start to be the normal everyday work uh, of the uh, players on the market. And uh, though the EDPS is not directly supervising the market, uh, our uh, involvement in the discussion about the ways the things are organized in the system is more and more visible. And a very good example of that uh, is our current uh, inquiry about the contractual clauses uh, that the EU institutions have uh, in the contracts with the big players outside of the EU institutions who are providing the software for the, um, for the EU institutions. The, the subject which is uh, uh, obvious for all the public institutions in the world where you actually have only few companies in the world that they pro can provide you with the uh, CRM systems uh, for the public administration, if you can call it like that, uh, but also the editing software in which the materials are prepared. And this system stopped to be just the editor, stopped to be just the places where you count the things. It's uh, uh, the, uh, that's the interconnected system of sending the data between the documents, uh, between the databases, between the resources uh, that are available for the uh, public administration. That also means that more and more data is stored uh, in service as a s uh, uh, software as a service systems, uh, so in the cloud, which is not bad itself. It's normal development uh, as far as uh, techniques uh, are concerned, but which also force us to ask the question, who has an access to the data? Who is the real controller? Who is deciding about the uh, way the system is organized and the data is processed? And uh, also, what kind of knowledge lies on the uh, side of those who are providing us with the software? What the telemetry knows, uh, what the telemetric system knows uh, about the users of such a sy uh, systems in, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, public institutions. That shows uh, that the organization of the work and the best knowledge about the uh, legal s uh, about the so software and the IT systems that you used is a part of accountability. And the part of accountability that you cannot regulate uh, in the legal text. That's something that has to go out of practice, which is the supervision practice, enforcement practice. But first of all, the organization and the business model uh, question for those who are processing the data and who wants to take uh, the advantage of them. Privacy by design is then the thing that I would uh, uh, talk for a long, long time to express uh, the uh, necessity of having it on board at the same time whilst I'm sure that there will be no law about privacy by design which will go farther than GDPR did. So let me just mention several points uh, where the new technologies uh, may create uh, the big challenges uh, for the data protection and for the supervisors, the things that we are discussing uh, both in the European Data Protection Board, uh, in the International Conference of Data Protection Commissioners, uh, but also in the other forums, like the Nordic Forum is as well. 
and uh, I believe that you will be discussing these topics during the uh, whole conference uh, that we are starting right now. So the wearables, the wearables, all different uh, patches, all different uh, uh, devices that we attach to our bodies uh, and that we use on an everyday basis, starting from those that are counting our steps uh, to those that are informing about our health conditions and very connected with it uh, and being uh, the more and more demanding and something that we have to be prepared for is the real human computer interface uh, that would enable us to get an information but probably also to steer the things in our bodies uh, throughout the electronic systems. All these uh, uh, right now all, all these chips that are right now in use, but also different kind of stimulators that are included into the bodies. And this is not, uh, this is not uh, uh, science fiction. You know in Sweden very well that uh, these devices start to be more and more popular in new countries. But we also have to remember that there are the things like deep brain stimulation, for example, which already exist. Those people who are, who are suffering from some neurological diseases uh, are using this b deep brain stimulation already now. And these are not the mechanic stimulators anymore. These are programmable small computers uh, which are attached to the brain of the person. And the whole uh, discussion about uh, what does it mean for transhumanism is the part of the ethical discussion, but also very practical technical discussion for us. Internet of Things uh, is the uh, environment which we will be dealing with it as well. So those uh, attached uh, devices or those uh, that are included in our body will be one of those that will communicate with each other throughout the system of the Internet of Things. And uh, despite Internet of Things did not become that popular as we, uh, as we thought uh, five or six years ago yet, we have to remember that we are right now at the point uh, where the uh, chips and different sensors uh, are going down to the individual products, to the individual boxes of these famous yogurts that will probably talk with each other very soon. And uh, my favorite uh, uh, example of uh, electronic diapers, uh, nappies uh, that are used uh, for the babies is the very good, uh, uh, very good uh, um, example of uh, uh, in introduction of uh, such uh, te technical innovations in the private life. But we have another topic which is uh, uh, sometimes thought as being uh, scientific, uh, sci uh, sci science fiction uh, solution, but which is actually already uh, present with us, uh, which are the connected and automated cars. The automated cars may probably be the huge change in the society, huge change for the law as well, but these are the connected cars which are more important for us uh, in the uh, data protection world. Because the car starts to be the biggest mobile device that we use uh, and the one that is collecting a lot of information about us and which we are also synchronizing other equipment with. And uh, uh, knowing that already for some years uh, uh, there are the social networks for the cars where the cars are contacting with each other without the knowledge of the drivers uh, shows us uh, that uh, these sci uh, science fiction models are actually right now in use uh, and our cars start to be a little bit more autonomous from our decisions than we thought. Well, artificial intelligence and uh, uh, all connected with it, uh, uh, social changes uh, and uh, uh, everyday changes of life uh, will be definitely the point of interest uh, for us in the nearest future. I'm a little bit afraid uh, of the statements that there is an idea to do in 100 days the new uh, law on artificial intelligence uh, in Europe uh, or that in next few years uh, we should create the system of fully regulated uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, the, in Europe or in the world. I don't believe it will be possible because the, the developments are really very fast and uh, developments are sometimes going out of what we thought uh, about a few years ago. 
Moreover, we are not talking about the things for the future. We are talking about the artificial intelligence, which is right now used uh, already for the, uh, for the uh, work of the law firms. It was 2016 when the first uh, law firm started to use artificial intelligent, uh, uh, artificial intelligent uh, uh, systems uh, in order to help the lawyers to take a decision in their everyday, uh, everyday work. Uh, we have an explosion of the discussion about the ethics uh, uh, and ethical issues connected with artificial intelligence, which is good itself. Uh, but uh, when I read uh, that we have at least uh, 10 documents on that on different uh, uh, level prepared by different organizations which are stating 47 principles uh, that should be dealt with uh, uh, when the artificial intelligence is concerned, I'm a little bit uh, nervous when I think that somebody can do the law out of that uh, in, the short, uh, in the short period. So I would rather uh, be keen on the discussion and on preparation of the, let's say, some pilot uh, projects and the sand digital sandboxes, uh, where the things like that can be uh, ch checked, can be tried, uh, with the participation of the uh, data protection authorities uh, that are assessing that, uh, but also the uh, law enforcement authorities uh, and also the public, uh, uh, public uh, entities. Facial recognition. Another topic which we just start to talk about. Profiling. Profiling going to the solutions like the Chinese social credit system, which starts to uh, organize every information about the citizen in order to take automatic decision about his future. I know once again that somebody can say, OK, this is China, this is another culture. But when we look at what the uh, local governments do, the way the municipalities are coming to the information about the citizens, we know that they want to use the profiles of the citizens for the good purposes. But once again, good purposes, that's one thing, uh, and the possible other use uh, of the information that comes uh, from the duties of the people, the way they behave, uh, the way they are treated and uh, they, are, uh, they are judged, but also uh, the way that uh, they are using the financial resources uh, may create uh, the pr problems in uh, uh, data protection. Cambridge Analytica scandal shown us uh, that this is also the problem of the profiling for the political use uh, and for the political purposes. Something which is not that new because actually we always had a kind of manipulation in the electoral process, but this is definitely something which uh, we have to get to know more about uh, and to find out uh, if we are in danger of using the data which is collected for the commercial purposes uh, or for the scientific purposes, uh, which are used then for the political purposes, which should not be allowed. Blockchain, uh, fintech, so all the solutions which are used in the financial uh, f financial world, these are definitely uh, the technical uh, challenges for the data protection law in the nearest future. Like the ones that we had before with the uh, client uh, profiling for the uh, anti-money laundering uh, purposes and also the things like deep fakes, uh, though I would not overestimate uh, the, uh, the, the danger of the deep fake uh, it is, uh, 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 I rather would say that this is one of the techniques that we have to know and we have to be able to uh, answer to answer to. So I think we know most of the challenges that we will deal with uh, in the next 10 years. Uh, the problem is that uh, sometimes we try to regulate them s fast. Sometimes we say, oh, let's talk about it in the later future when we will know how it will develop. And the real answer for the citizen, for protecting the rights of citizen, is somewhere in between. In between remembering that we are the regulators who are working, working on the legal background and the fact that we should not regulate too fast. We should be aware of what's going on. Thus, I would like to uh, call all of, of you, to, to have a request to all of you, 
to work with the data protection authorities uh, and to explain them what is the uh, what is the development, what is the stage of development uh, uh, of the new technologies right now and the business models right now. Because the worst things which may, may happen is that uh, the technology or the business models uh, will develop the way that the regulators would not understand. Because then their actions, once again done, bo done for the uh, public good, uh, may actually be stopping the developments which are, uh, which are uh, expected and which should be in use. I think the cloud computing is the good example of the uh, good cooperation between those who were in introducing that and the data protection uh, commissioners. I remember 10 years ago, 11 years ago, uh, many data protection authorities were very, very reluctant on dealing with uh, cloud computing, but being explained how all the models, including software as a service, operate uh, and what can be the pros of that, uh, the, most of the DPAs, most of the data protection authorities uh, came to the conclusion that this is something normal. We just need the fair, uh, con fair conditions uh, to use it. So, once again, I call you for the contact with the data protection authorities uh, the exchange of the knowledge, uh, and I hope that Nordic Privacy for Nordic Pri Privacy Arena is the very good place uh, for those dealing uh, with the uh, data protection from in the public institutions and from the public point of view to understand uh, what's going on in the market uh, and to uh, and to avoid uh, the unnecessary problems that may exist between the stakeholders uh, and uh, the data protection specialists. Uh, Thank you for this possibility to address you at the beginning of the conference. Uh, I wish you uh, have a wonderful time in Stockholm. And once again, I'm sorry that I was not able to come to the conference. Thank you.